Well, welcome today. Go ahead and stand up and just get ready to rejoice in the Lord. It is a good day to rejoice. Hallelujah. Your presence is here, Lord, and so we rejoice in your goodness to us. We rejoice that you are here. No matter if it's snowing outside, you are here with us today. Your presence is here. So we rejoice in you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Rejoice in you, Jesus. Just like the man carried him by his friends, your power is present and it never ends. I can't just be simply sitting by. Let's take hold this morning. Expecting great things, I must expect in order to receive. And I build my faith by hearing your word, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I believe. Oh, I know. from you, Jesus. I will receive, yes, I receive by faith. Your grace, it flows to me. I will receive, yes, I receive. i 
presence is here to help us. Hallelujah. You are so good, God. Oh, you are faithful. There is joy unspeakable and full of your glory. Because Jesus, there is nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness where all my fears fade to praise. Oh, we praise you, Lord, Savior. There is nothing like your freedom. Dancing with the hope of heaven where all my fears fade to praise. Jesus, all I want more of you and less of me. I will sing of all your goodness, where all my fears fade to praise. All I want is more of you. All I want, more of you and less of me. All I want, living in your victory. All I want, let your glory fill this place. Cause there's joy. lift up some praise to him today. Oh, you will be praised, Jesus. Jesus. We praise your name. We praise your name. Jesus. Well, ooh, there it is. Well, praise God. Don't you have joy this morning? Amen. Yay. You know, now let me just ask you a question. Aren't you glad that your joy is not based on your circumstances? That's true. You know, 
Because if our joy was based on our circumstances, any time we would have an up and down or a valley in our life, that would mean that our joy would be based on that. But our joy is based on whose we are. Our joy is based on the King of Kings. Our joy is based on Jesus Christ who came and died for us. And how many of you know he never has a bad day? Amen? His days are always up. So, you know, remind yourself. You know, as they were singing that song, I started thinking about that. Remind yourself that your joy is not based on your circumstances. Your joy is based on whose you are. Amen? Well, praise God. Welcome this morning. We're so excited to have you here. Go ahead and shake each other's hand and welcome each other in the house of God this morning. Well, welcome again this morning. We're so excited to have you here this morning on this great day in October. Amen? Uh, what a great day it is to be in the house of God. I'm so glad you didn't believe the reports that we were going to get four and a half feet of snow this morning. Amen? I was looking at the reports throughout yesterday and today, you know, and it started from 18, 20 inches down to, you know, just somebody threw a little bit of snow down on the roads. You know what I mean? But uh, I'm so happy for that. Uh, thank you so much for coming on out this morning. And, uh, you know, normally, normally when you go somewhere and you come back, you're supposed to bring something back with you. You know, pastor was just gone for a week, you know, on vacation. How many of you believe that our pastor deserves a nice vacation? Amen? I tell you what, I hope that you, you truly believe that. Uh, and so, you know, he was down in Florida, you know, and he didn't bring any nice weather back with him. Amen? Or any wins on the golf course I heard about as well. Amen? Hey, all right, there we go, all right. Theron was awake this morning. Thank you, Theron, I appreciate that. But anyway, uh, aren't you glad to have our pastor back, you know, and uh, if you didn't get an opportunity to listen to Wednesday night's uh, message, go listen to it. It was really, really good. It was really good. Jeff did a great job. I was down in Colorado Springs, had a chance to watch it on live stream. I'm glad we have live stream, and we're glad that you joined us on live stream as well, that you had, do took this opportunity to gather with us this morning and just to worship our God. So no matter where you're at, just remember that, that your joy is not based on your That's circumstances. Right. Right. Your joy is based on whose you are. You are a child of God, so that is where your joy comes from. Yes. So you can tell yourself every morning, joy. Amen. Just look at yourself in the mirror and say, joy, right? You got to say it with a little bit of attitude, right? Joy. But anyway, thank you so much for, welcome, uh, for coming with us this morning. And no matter where you're watching this from, just type it in. We have people monitoring it. You have a praise report, a prayer request. We would love to, we would love to just get excited with you for your, your, your praise reports. And also, if you have a prayer request, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that where two or three are gathered, there he is also. And if we ask anything in his name, that he would do it. So you can go ahead and type that in there as well. And if you happen to be in the sanctuary and you're a first-time guest, we got a guest welcome center back at the back of the sanctuary. Just come on back there. We've got a free gift we'd like to give you. Just talk to you for just a little bit. Uh, you're right at home. You're amongst family. So thank you so much for coming on out this morning. Just got some announcements here real quickly. Of course, they're all in your, your bulletin. So if you didn't get one, please take one home. Uh, ladies, if you're attending the, the uh, conference that's coming up here, uh, in, not this week, but the following week, you need to have your registration and your money paid uh, by October 30th. So you got to have that done. If you look in your bulletin, there's a couple of different ways that you can pay it by bringing it in the office. The hours are in there as well. But please make sure you get all paid up before uh, the 30th. Uh, that's the deadline. If you have any questions, you can see Kelly. She's right over here. If you have any questions about that. Men, our ugly Thai dinner is coming up. Amen. We're excited about that. That's always a great, fun time. Uh, if you've never been part of one, uh, you know, just what you do is really simple. Just find the ugliest tie you can find. And uh, I had one young man tell me this morning, he said, I don't have any ties. And I said, that's perfect. Just go to the Goodwill and find one. Amen. I mean, you know, go in there and say, I'm looking for the ugliest tie 
that you, can, that you have in here and just get it, wrap it up, however you want to wrap it up. I mean, we've seen everything from paper towels to, to I mean, Hello Kitty paper and everything else, right? Wrap it up and bring it in, and we just have a great time of fun and fellowship. Here's the good part. It is absolutely free. It's free, all right? The, the dinner is free. The fellowship's free. Everything is free. But here's the thing. We got to know how many people are coming so we can prepare ahead of time. So please, make sure that you sign up if you're going to be coming. And also, if you do sign up, make sure you come as well because, of course, you know, we know emergencies do happen, but there's sometimes that happens where, you know, you'll have, uh, you know, 122 people sign up for something and only 30 show up. Well, we're planning to, to be ready for you, so please sign up uh, in the foyer. If you have any questions, you can talk to Paul Blanchett over here or Jeremy Russell or uh, Bob Winters. You can talk to him as well. Also, our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes are almost due. They're due on November 17th here, so bring them here. Uh, we'll get them to the place here in Cheyenne where they're going to be shipping them out. But, you know, what a great opportunity to minister to people all over the world. And it's so amazing to me. We've been involved with Operation Christmas Child probably 18 years. You know, it's been a long time. And, and you know, you can, you can pack a shoebox and send it somewhere in the world where a child, that may be the only thing they receive all year. But not only do they receive the things inside the box, but also at the processing center, they put the story of Jesus in their language in that box as well. And so that goes there as well. So it's not just providing them little toys or whatever it is. It's also giving them the gospel. And how many of you know that for the, the small amount that it takes to fill a box and, and to pay the shipping, you can affect a child's life for the, an entire lifetime? I mean, that's worth it. Don't you think so? I think that's absolutely worth it. So they're due by the 17th, so please make sure you get them in by them. And the last thing I want to mention here just real quickly is we have our Kamiya House dinner coming up. This is our a special meal that we do once a year in November. Uh, we need about $1,100 for the meal. We have 155 uh, sewn right now, and we need about 15 to 20 people to help as well. Uh, and and uh, just real quickly, I know we've talked about this before, but if you're new, this particular meal, we actually have them sit down, and we come up and we serve them. We serve them their drinks, their food, uh, we decorate, we make it really special because you know what? They're special to the kingdom of God. They're special, they're special to our Heavenly Father, and we want to do the same thing as well to them. So again, 15 to 20 people, we still need about, oh, about $1,000 to finish up the meal, but God is good. Amen. And thank you so much for your faithfulness to that ministry throughout the year. Uh, Pastor David, come on up. Amen. Praise God. Well, you didn't have to say that I didn't win anything when I was down in Florida, you know. Uh, well, we did have a good time, and, you know, it's just a good opportunity. Met a couple uh, pastors and ministers that I hadn't uh, met before, and, and so uh, thank you and uh, for allowing me to, to be able to go and to enjoy that. And, uh, uh, you know, when I looked at the weather, uh, Brother Larry said, you know, tell Linda you're not going to come back for another week. And I said, I don't think that'll go over real well. <laughs> and, and so uh, anyways, we had a great time down there. And thank you again. I just want to uh, give a big shout out. Uh, you see the sanctuary all put back together this morning. And uh, I want to give a big uh, shout out first to uh, uh, Alicia Smith. And she's upstairs. Amen. Yeah, maybe we can hear it up there. Right. She did an awesome job getting everything ready uh, for our, our, our fall festival, Zootopia, yesterday. And, uh, and so we thank God for, for her and all the time that she put in. I know her kiddos that helped her as well. But also all those that, that volunteered. Thank you so much for those that came in. Uh, that helped decorate, that helped uh, the games we had. I think she said we had 12 stations counting our, uh, the kids could go downstairs, get their uh, faces painted, and we had hot chocolate, and, and you went through, we went through a bunch of popcorn, and I think some forgot to put it in their mouths because it was all over the, it was all over the floor, but, but awesome time, awesome time. I think there was 10 stations up here. Uh, and the kids just had a blast, and of course we had lots of candy, so thank you, and uh, for all those that participated yesterday and, and such, and she said they had 200 bags, uh, and so um, she said we only have five or six uh, left, but she said there was a few that took more um, than one bag, so we figured about 175 children that, that come in yesterday, and, and uh, over 300 adults, uh, counting teenagers and such, and so uh, we had different ones share with us. They've been to different events and said uh, uh, they felt this was uh, the best that they had been to. So praise God. So give, your, give yourself a hand this morning. Amen. And uh, again, and 
And then thank you for the crew. Uh, come back upstairs, man. They had the chairs all put back together. That's not an easy task to get them all, you know, looking even and straight. And, uh, you know, so, they're, you know, so as pastor, you're not looking down the, no, I'm just kidding. But they, uh, thank you again. We appreciate it so much. And all those that pitched in and helped and uh, God is a good God. Amen? Amen. And we believe just impacting. And, um, you know, as Pastor Gail said about the um, Christmas shoe box, you know, if you give online, you, you can give by check, of course, put it in the box. But if you do it online, then you can track uh, where your box goes to. They will, they'll send you a tracking number. And, you know, so that's kind of cool. I think that's neat. So wherever it, might, wherever it might go. And, of course, you know, I know there's lots of opportunities out there. Uh, you know, where you can be a blessing, and this is something we've done as a church for quite a few years, and of course, uh, our Camilla House, and I know they really appreciate. So I want the ushers, we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, give this morning, amen, and uh, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 16, I know I've probably shared on this before, but verse 16, it talks about three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And, and, you know, sometimes people, they look at the Old Testament and say, well, that's under the law and such. But, and they say, well, the cross, you know, changed things. Well, what the cross did, it didn't change God, it changed you and I. And that's what the cross was for, is to change us. And, 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 and the whole purpose, and, and it really is a principle here, whenever we come, Whenever we come to worship God, when we come into a, a, a service that we don't come empty-handed, it's important that we do that. And, and, and Paul relates this over in 2 Corinthians 9, 5, when he was talking to the Corinthians about, uh, about having a gift prepared and having a gift ready. And, and in the Amplified of that verse, it says, so that, it's kind of interesting, it says, so that you are not extorted. Anybody know what extortion is, right? I've been reading Rick Renner's, uh, 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 gone back over and read his uh, Sparkling Gems 1. And he's been, he took one verse, he's been on it for a whole week. When Paul talks about being perils and perils of this and perils of that. And, and so, you know, if you don't know Rick Renner, he, uh, back in 1991, he took his family to start a ministry over in the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, establish a church. Well, they have the Russian mafia over there. And, 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 he, and so when they would take, when they would take the, the, the um, uh, film uh, for the TV shows and they went into places that, you know, a lot of people hadn't gone and, and the guy would get beat up and, and the guy would get, he got robbed and he got stolen from and, you know, and, or they would do, they went into uh, one city and they tried to extort him because they're like, you got to pay us money because we run this city. And such so like that. Well, we don't want to be that way with the gospel, do we? And I, I believe that when we come with a prepared heart, now there are times for spontaneous giving. There are times when the Holy Spirit will say, no, I want you to give this amount. But that's, that's the exception, not the norm or not the rule. We should always be prepared. And I, I believe God is pleased with that because that shows faith. That when we make preparation, and even in coming to church, you know, we, we live in a society today, entertain me, Pastor, and, and I want to be entertained and such like that because we see things on, on TV and and. And such, and, and I believe it helps us when we prepare our hearts before we come. And one of those things, because, you know, you ever thought about this? God knows that, that a lot of what we do is tied to money. Uh -huh. That's true. Right? Yeah. It's tied to money. You know, if you go out to eat today, guess what? Unless they're just really, really generous and they're going to say, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, yeah, show me the money, you know, went last night and, and, and I, or no, I don't know where I was at and I got to thinking, oh yeah, you, you want payment. I was just kind of fiddling around and I was kind of like, oh yeah, got to pay for this food. You know, you're not going to give it to me for free and everything is tied to money. And, we, and I think God understands that. And that's why, see, it's a heart. First of all, where's our heart? Where's our heart in all this? And so whenever we come, no matter what, no matter how much, you know, I know we give our tithes and such like that, but we should always, always put something yes. in the offering. We should always put something, always sow a, always sow a seed because uh, God knows. Amen? Yes, so hallelujah. And we know, of course, the blessings that come back, uh, that when we do that, that when we sow a seed, whether it's of our tithes, whether it's of our offerings, we know God promised. God's not a uh, stingy, is he? No. He's El Shaddai, yes. right? Yes. He's the God of more than enough. Say more than enough. More than enough. 
Hallelujah. He, he knows what you need, and uh, he, he wants to amply supply, and he's, he's done so much for us. So we have a confession we'd like to say, so why don't you join uh, with us as we say this this morning. This is my seed. I sow it into the kingdom of God. I sow it because I love God and want to see Family Harvest Church continue to fulfill what God has called us to do, building families that are happy, stable, fruitful, and blessed. I believe that as I sow my seed, it shall be given to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, it shall come back to me in many ways. I thank you, Lord, for many opportunities coming my way. I thank you that the windows of heaven are opening because of my obedience to sow my seed. I thank you, Lord, for the favor of God upon my life and the grace to prosper as you have promised me in your word. So, Father, we praise you and we honor you. Father God, we thank you for the promises that we have in your word. We thank you, Father God, that you are El Shaddai. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the God that sees. You are the God that provides for us, Lord God. And we give you glory and honor. And Father, we thank you that, that as we give of our tithes and offerings, Lord God, that we can be a blessing. Father, here in Cheyenne, Wyoming, Father, and, and not just here in Cheyenne, Father, in, in, in the state of Wyoming, and Father, in this four-state region, Father God, and in, Father God, all these areas, Father God, that uh, in the United States and around the world, Father God, and supporting those that go into regions that have never heard the gospel, Father, that have never heard the truth that Jesus loves them and Jesus died for them and Jesus paid the price and that God has provided for an abundant life for them through Christ Jesus. And so we give you glory and honor, Father God. And Lord, we just want to let you know how much we love you, how much we appreciate you by our giving this morning, Lord God, to further your kingdom. And we give you all the glory and honor. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Rush, just go ahead and serve the people if you would. And, and we thank you once again for your giving and your faithfulness. And we're going to worship God some more this morning. So after the buckets go by, why don't you go ahead and stand back up on your feet. And uh, let's just continue to worship him in song.
secure in your love. I'm secure in your love. I'm secure in your love. I'm secure in your love, Jesus. We can just rest in his love this morning because he chose us. Hallelujah. Because I am chosen, not forsaken. his children. Hallelujah. We serve a great, great God. We can rest in you, Jesus. And who you are is who I am. Thank you. How great. The splendor. The splendor. me 
lift our worship up. Then sings my soul to you, Jesus. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to Thee, all to You, Lord. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings. sings my soul. Let's just lift up our hearts to God today as we sing that. It's all to you, Lord. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Just lift up your heart to God today. It's all to you, Lord. How great thou art. How great who you are in me, Lord. Oh, that's who you are in me, Lord. Your greatness, I've got it all on the inside. Oh, that greatness, your greatness lives in me. How great you are. Then sings my Father, we thank you for your greatness, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord. There's nothing too big for you, Lord yes. God, because you are a great and yes. awesome God, Lord yes. God. And as, Father, as we, as we read your word, and Father God, as we see all the times that you delivered people, Father God, we thank you that you haven't changed. You're yes. the same as you were, Father God, Woo, when yes. we read, Father God, in the Old Testament, and when you delivered Paul, and when you delivered others, Lord God, you're the same God. Yes, and there's nothing are. too big for you, God. And we just praise you, yes, Father. Yes, and we yes, honor we you, Lord you, God. And yes. Father, we thank you today, no matter what yes. we're going through, no matter thank situation you. and circumstance, Lord, our God is bigger. Yes. Our God is greater. Yes. Our God is mightier. Thank you, Lord. And you are. You still thank heal. You. you still deliver. You save. We thank you, Lord God. You fill with your spirit. Thank you, Lord God. You still perform miracles, Lord yes. God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that, that it may not be in the degree or the, uh, and the, uh, the, the vastness of uh, parting the Red Sea, but, Lord, you still part ways for us, Lord, that we, we may walk in all that you have for us, and so we honor you. 
and praise you. Before you see it, if you just join with me in praying for a couple of people, some of you uh, probably know uh, Nicole, uh, uh, I almost said Nicole Kidman, but uh, Nicole Hilton uh, was, yeah, she needs prayer too. She was uh, hospitalized uh, uh, early this week and, and she is back home, still waiting on some tests and things have improved. And so we want to pray for her. And then we got a, uh, got a text just uh, as worship started, um, as actually as Pastor Hill was announcing, uh, Willie Banks, he, he was hospitalized briefly. Calcium uh, was low, but it's back up and he's back home. So why don't you join? You know, there's power and agreement, right? Yes, and, and so, Father, we just pray for Nicole and we lift her up before you, Father, and we thank you for continued healing in her body, Lord God. And we speak to her body and we speak to her blood and you be normal in the name of Jesus right now. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that, that you give doctors wisdom, but we thank you there's no God as big as our God yes, and yes. no God as great as our God. And so we thank you in the name of Jesus, Lord God. We, we just thank you for wholeness, Lord, uh, not just healing, but wholeness in her blood. And whatever is causing the deficiency, we thank you for right now, for restoring and completing the work that you've begun in her, in yes. Jesus' name. And yes. Father, we lift up Brother Willie Banks to you, and we just thank you, Father God, for his calcium levels coming back up to where they need to be. Yes. And we thank you right now, in Jesus' name, for your healing power flowing in his body, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. Well, you may be seated, and welcome once again. Glad you're here. Uh, today and uh, praise God for his goodness. Amen. And so we're going to continue on uh, uh, the series on identity restored. He's going to fix me here. Uh, um, uh, our identity restored. And uh, you know, as I shared last week, raised in a church that um, didn't hear this stuff, didn't know who I was in Christ Jesus. And, you know, we heard the Ten Commandments every Sunday, and, and there's a lot of condemnation in, in my life. I'll be, even after I was born again, I still had a lot of condemnation. I did not, I didn't, I mean, I know a little bit of the Word, but, you know, I didn't know. I didn't know what God had done for me in Christ Jesus. We were never taught that. And, and so, you know, every, every week and even later on, you know, I remember going back home and I thought, man, I've done every one. I've broken every one of those Ten Commandments. And even though I knew I was born again um, and, and such, I, I didn't have a complete peace in my heart. Uh, I mean, I knew I was saved. I knew I was going to heaven. And, and, and then years later, and when I was in Bible school back in 1981, 1982, and the gentleman that come in and taught on righteousness and ch totally changed my life. Totally changed me on the inside and, and understanding who I was and what God had done on the inside. And I see so many people, I see so many people that aren't walking in wholeness that God desires for them. Walking in far less than what God desires in the beginning, I believe it begins right here in our identity. You know, sometimes people talk about self-worth, and, and, and when you, if you look at it as self-worth, then, then you're still going to live defeated because it's, it's the worth that God gives you. It, it, through Jesus Christ and through the blood uh, of Jesus Christ. It's, it's no other way that you're going to get worth. There's no other way that you're going to find who you truly are and who you really are. And, and so I encourage you to, to study uh, the scriptures. You know, I shared a few weeks ago, we talked about living in the epistles. And, you know, some people, they want to go back to Leviticus and they look at all the bad things and what God talks about there and, you know, get out of Leviticus, Amen. okay? And, and there's nothing wrong. It teaches us some things, teaches us there's types and shadows there. But a lot of times people dwell on what, you know, they've done wrong. And in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. And these are things you have to meditate on. Because I guarantee the devil's going to remind you, he well, look what you did. You know, there's still times he'll come back at me, look what you did when you were in college. I thought, devil, that's an old tune. That's an old song, <laughs> right? But he'll still come back at you, what you. Look what you did yesterday. Look what, no, in Christ Jesus, you are a brand new person. And yes. you have to, you got to say that. You need to meditate on that. That, that. That's not the old me. When he brings up your past, you know, people say, remind him of his future. No, you remind him of who you are in Christ Jesus. I know that sounds real spiritual, remind him of his future. No, remind him of who you are that's right. in Christ Jesus. Because that's, that's what's going to defeat him, and that's what's going to enable you to live in victory. And, and it helps you to become righteousness conscious rather than sin 
conscious. So many people are sin conscious. They're so, they're so right. Well, this is what I did, and this is what I know. You know, your, your slate has been wiped clean. Yes, so you're brand new. And I like the way Galatians 2.20, and this is out of the, the Passion Translation. It says, my old identity. Say, my old identity. Everybody say that. It says, my old identity has been co-crucified with Messiah and no longer lives. For the nails of his cross crucified me with him. And now the essence of this new life is no, is, um, uh, now this essence is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. Now we, last week we gave you some cards, and then if you didn't get those, we still, um, I, I came across this. God, dis, God didn't just repair the old you, he created a new you in Christ Jesus. In other words, he didn't just put a band-aid over it. I mean, I was the, other, the other day I was playing golf and, and my, my uh, finger's still sore. And so when you, when you play golf, you have a ball mark and, and it's a divot tool. And so we were playing what they call scramble on Wednesday. And so I had the last guy to putt, so he tossed me the divot tool. I wasn't really thinking about it. I just reached down and grabbed it. Well, it's pointy on the end, and it jabbed me right there. And I, and I thought, oh, that kind of hurt. And then I looked down, and there's blood dripping down on me. I thought, great. You know, we were like on hole number seven, you know. You still got, you know, the rest of the morning, the rest of the... Fortunately, the guy that was there, he had a Band-Aid. And, you know, because you can't go around and I can see, you know, swinging the club, blood squirting all over, you know, all over the place and such. But a lot of times, see, people, they try when it comes to spiritual things, they try to put a Band-Aid on, right? You know, they try to cope. Guess what? What God has done for us in Christ Jesus, you don't have to try and cope. You can overcome, right? I don't have to cope with it. You know, people, I'm just coping. No, I'm overcoming, Right? And that's the way you can too, because of that new life on the inside of you. And, and so, again, it's that keenness to walking in health. You know, sometimes people say, well, you know, brother, I'm, I'm German, I'm Italian, I'm this, I'm that. Right? You know, or, or we'll look at our hair color, or we'll look at our, our eye color. You know, sometimes people say, you know, I think I should this last week. You know, I, was, I wanted blonde hair and blue eyes, because it seemed like all the girls like the blonde haired guys and the blue, blue eye guys. You know, we had, we, we had the guys uh, that came from the beach, and, and, and you could always tell. Now, on the, on the Gulf of Mexico, you didn't have huge waves unless you had a storm that was out there, and then it would create. So we could always tell, it might be sunny there, you know, inland uh, and, and all that, and even out on the beach. But, but if there was a storm out in the Gulf somewhere, it would create big waves. And so we call them the, you know, beaches or whatever you want to, uh, not the BGs, the, the BGs, right? And uh, you can always tell because they were out surfing. And of course, if you're out in the sun a lot, you know, I would, my hair, you know, was, uh, um, from, you know, swimming in a pool or whatever, chlorine, it would get a little streaked and such like that. And these guys, and, you know, sometimes the girls are just like, oh, you know. And so <laughs> I wanted to have blonde hair, blue eyes. And, and you know, and sometimes people are that way. They want to have this, they want to have that. Oh, I wish I was this, or I wish I was that. I wish my body shape was this, or my body shape was that. I wish I was taller, you know. Or I wish I was shorter. And, and really, see, when, when we say those things, right, it, what we're saying is, God, you didn't know yeah. how to create me. You didn't know yeah. the, the type of thing. And, and really, we're putting a blame. We may not think that, but we're putting a blame on God. Yeah. And, and so when you find out and you know who you are in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're blonde hair, blue eye, if you're dark haired, if you've got no hair, if you, okay, you understand what I'm saying? If you're tall, if you're short. You know, if you've got premature gray hair, it doesn't matter because you, your identity is in Christ Jesus, not, not your, your physical, not, not your natural, not where you come from, not your skin color. You have a lot today. You know, Paul said this, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. And that's what you have to look at. And that'll help you. Not only will it help you looking at yourself, but it'll help you looking at other people. Because you'll see them in Christ rather than skin color or hair color or eye color or whatever it may be or where they come from or their background. 
You know, so often in society and even in church, we look at people, well, you know, their education or I don't have as good an education. It doesn't matter who you are in Christ Jesus. And I'm not saying it's, I'm not saying don't get an education. I'm not saying that, but don't base your status. Don't base your social standing, whatever it may be, on those things. Because, you know, I, I, I see found out when I, I went to a Christian school and, and first through eighth grade, and I was one of the, I was always one of the fastest people. Well, you know, when you only have 40 people around, you know, it's not hard to be one of the fastest people. Mm-hmm. When you only have five in your grade, it's not hard to be the fastest in, you know, a, a class of only five people. I get to high school. I go from, I go from a, a, a school, the majority of my, uh, uh, you know, for six and a half, you know, halfway through my seventh grade, for the majority of the time, there's only about 40, 45 students. It did jump up uh, my eighth grade year to about 250. And we had 25 in my, my uh, at that time, we graduated eighth grade class. I go to a high school that there's over 3,000. And just in the ninth grade, there's 1,000. Just one class, like an English class, there's 25 to 30 people. When I went out for football, all of a sudden, I'm not the fastest guy. Kind of shocked me. I can remember when we would have sprints, and I'm thinking, there's about a half a dozen guys that can run faster than me. That was a big shock. Because I was, I was fast. I always looked at, you know. And see, there's always going to be someone that's faster than you. There's always going to be someone, sad to say, that can play golf better than you. <laughs> no. You understand what I'm saying? There, there's, and, and, and if you're not careful, we get comparing. We get into comparitis. But no, see, we look at ourselves through Christ Jesus. And, 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 and of course, the enemy of our soul. And so in Christ is where we find our true identity. It's where we find true, our true self. It's where we find our true worth. It's in Christ Jesus. And now uh, you, you have to keep reminding yourself of this because of the world, yeah. right? You know, when we, you know, you look at a commercial, they, you know, what do they show? What do they, when you look at these things, you know, and um, whatever it may be, you look at these things and the image that the world has, and of course the enemy's right there just pounding you over the head and reminding you of your past, reminding you of what you did, reminding you of what you said. You say, no, this is who I am in Christ Jesus. This is my true identity. It's my true identity. God changed. See, when you became born again, God changed it all. Aren't you glad? He changed it all. And, and there's freedom when we understand that. And, and again, so that's why I encourage you, live in the epistles. Look at what Paul says. Look at what the epistles, especially Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, who you are. You know, highlight, underline it, write them out. I mean, we have a book here, In Him. You know, it makes it easy for you to find all those scriptures. But, but you need to search those out. This is who I am in Christ Jesus. Just as, you know, I'm accepted. Say, I'm accepted. I'm accepted. All right. You know, how many remember DeGarmo and Key? You know, let's date some of us here. Somebody said, wow. Uh, DeGarmo and Key. And he said, I remember how they, had, they had a song. And they said, I may not have been the homecoming queen. I might not have been, you know, go through. But I'm accepted by the one who matters the most. Right. And that's what you have to look at it. Not, you know, it's not in an arrogant way. You know, well, bless God, God accepts me. And it, you know, you don't do it in an arrogant way. Right? You don't throw it back in people's faces. Right? You know? Now oh, people used to hate me or whatever. And I, they didn't like me in high school. And now I'm going to get back at them. And now you're accepted by the one. And you're not forsaken. Why? Because Jesus Christ, he was forsaken. So you could be accepted. Yeah, right. And so you remind yourself of that. Yes. See, it's not just good to just think about it. You've got to speak that out. I'm accepted. You know, hopefully this song, you might say, well, thank you, thanks, Pastor. Because I asked him last week, I said, do you guys know this song? I said, can you do this to go along with this series? Because I understand the power of music. And you get that in your head. I'm accepted. I'm forsaken. I'm not forsaken. I'm a child of God. I am who he says I am. And it doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the enemy says. 
And you know, and again, people, what pastors, what it says in Leviticus, get out of Leviticus, get out of Deuteronomy, get over into Ephesians where it says, I am accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ. And now you can come into his presence. So, so this morning we're going to look at, real quick this morning, we're going to look at three things that will help you with your uh, overcoming a false identity because that's really what it is. It's a false identity. You know, we hear about things being stolen and stuff, and that's what the enemy has stolen from so many believers is who they truly are in Christ Jesus. So the first thing, and this may seem real elementary, but, but how many of us really understand this? Number one, you are loved by God the Father. Something you have to remind yourself, you know, and I've said this before, you know, I think as adults we need to sing that song over and over, Jesus loves me, Amen. this I know for the Bible tells me so, right? Oh, that's just for little kids. No, no, it's for us adults too. And we have to remind ourselves over and over again, God loves me. And, and this love that God has for us is not based on what we do or what we have done. And, and that's so hard, I think, sometimes because here again, everything in life is merit-based, right? It's merit-based. It, it's based on, uh, you know, we have rewards out there. You know, you get credit cards, they have rewards. If you spend enough money, you're going to get, you know, um, every time I fly in a certain airline, you know, they want to give you a credit card and you'll get this many miles and what? Rewards. It's merit-based. Or, you know, where we work, merit-based, what, whatever it may be. And that's the world that we live in. And not, not necessarily that it's wrong, but when it comes to God and what God has done for us, not based on our merits, it's based on one person's merit, and that's Jesus Christ and what he has done. Yes. And so his love for us. You know, years ago I can remember uh, uh, one of the kids, Uncle Unkies, Unkies? <laughs> Uncle Monkey, yeah. Uh, uh, one of the kids' uncles... We kept calling, you guys, you guys are just brats. And I just said to him, I love, I said, don't, don't call my kids brats. I said, you know, they might act like brats, but they're not brats. Yeah. You know, don't, you know, see, we be careful what we say over people and such. And, and, and so I just, you know, because uh, I didn't want them growing up thinking that way. I didn't want them growing up because the world already is telling people so many things. And I didn't want them growing up thinking that they were that way. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at what does God say? Because then it becomes, a, they do things to, to not be a brat rather than their love. You know, it's very interesting. You ever notice what, the, the, before Jesus ever started in the ministry, what, what God spoke over him? When he come up out of the waters after being baptized, you know what God said? Before he ever did anything. Before he ever, before he went out, he got led of the, the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, before he performed any miracles, before he healed anybody, you know what God said? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God, God spoke a positive word over Jesus. Said, yeah, but Jesus was the son of God. But he also was a man. And he operated as a man, full of the Holy Spirit when he walked upon this earth. But see, it wasn't just for Jesus, it's for you and I to understand that God looks at us, but he doesn't look at us, he doesn't accept us or love us based on what we do. He loves us because of who he is, but also because he sees worth. He sees worth in you. And we talk about the diamond in the rock. You know, uh, Michelangelo, you know, when he, when he, when he, when he sculptures some, you know, how did you get that, you know, well, I just chipped away all that wasn't. He chipped away all that wasn't. When he did his, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing of David, he chipped all that wasn't David or what, you know, and that's, see, that's what God does. See, he sees us in Christ Jesus and he sees the worth that we have. And in Romans 5, 8, the, uh, um, uh, and so really, uh, let me back up. Point A of that is God desired to have a relationship with you. Think about that. God desired to have a relationship with you. And in Romans 5, 8, and this out of the passion, it says, but Christ proved, I love this, God's passionate. Everybody say passionate. God, Christ proved God's passionate love for us by dying in our place while we were still lost and ungodly. Think about that. His passionate love while we were still lost. You know, think of the faith and think of, the, in a sense, the, what God had to do. God, 
God didn't send Gabriel down here first of all or Michael down here first of all. God knowing, sending his son to the cross and dying for our sins, he knew there were people that would reject him yep. and reject the salvation he had, yet he did it anyways. Think about that. God's passionate love. God's, you know, one, you know, crazy love, right? He's passionately in love with you, and he, he desires to have that relationship with you. Point B, God loves you. Now, this is sometimes hard to wrap our brain around. God loves you with the same love that he loved Jesus. See, we look at Jesus. He was perfect, never did anything wrong, you know, always did the Father's will, always did everything that pleased the Father. And we think, yeah, well, he was easy to love. You know, the God, God loved him before. And see, if we're not careful, you know, get into that comparitis, God loves you with the same love. And listen to what Jesus said, and this is out of the Passion again, um, or the New Living Translation. It's, I in them, and you are in me, may they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me, and that you love them as much as you love me. Listen to the Passion says, you live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfectly, perfect unity, and the world will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. God loves you with the same love that he loved Jesus. He, he loves you passionately. And, you know, I, I love, and I borrowed this from, you know, Andrew Womack, uh, you know, God's not mad at you. <laughs> God is not mad at you. He's not. Yeah, but I did something wrong. He's not mad at you. Now, we might get mad at people when they do things wrong. And we might get upset with people. Now, it doesn't mean that he, he likes it when we do things wrong. But God's not mad at you. And God's not upset with you. Well, Pastor, you're giving people, you know, when you tell people these kind of things, then they're just going to live however they want to live. You know, I've learned over the years that, that you can motivate people by fear or you can motivate people by faith. And I'd much rather do it by faith and love. You can motivate people. Oh, if you don't live right, God's going to get you. And there's so much out there in Christendom that fear-based, trying to motivate people to live because of fear. Or if you don't live right, you know, this is going to happen to you and that's going to happen to you. Well, we need to live right. But see, when you know how much God loves you and you know that God accepts you, you know, have you ever had a boss that, that just, you know, berates you all the time and just hard on you all the time and just, you know, you don't want to work for someone like that. And I'm not talking about being corrected. I'm not talking about times when you need to be corrected. But, but when you have somebody that all the time is just, you, just, you know, you'll work for them, but you, you're like, man, this is not a joy, right? God wants our life to be full of joy, just like that song that we sang this morning. And so he's not mad at you. And I'll help you understand that'll free you up to live in a life that, that is pleasing. You talked about, we sang, I think it was last week, you know, there's no fear in his love. And, and John the Baptist's dad prophesied that now we can serve you without fear. See, if I'm motivated by fear, I'm always going to be looking over my shoulder, looking over my shoulder, looking over my shoulder, because I'm concerned that I'm not doing everything right. Right? So God's not mad at you. Look what it says in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But God is so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Now, I don't think we have this, but the voice uh, says it this way. But God with unfathomable riches. In other words, you can't, you can't imagine with unfathomable riches, richness of his love and mercy focused on us, united us with the anointed one and has infused our lifeless souls with life. I love that. God. <laughs> Even though we were buried under mountains of sin and he saved us by his grace. Hallelujah. Can't fathom the richness of his love. One definition of that word mercy is uh, where we get the word plutocrat. And a plutocrat is one, one of the definitions of one who uses their wealth to influence others. 
So God's mercy influenced us. Hallelujah. And then number three, not under, or point C, not understanding God's love for you will hinder you from knowing and being filled with all of his fullness. See, God wants us filled with his fullness. And walking in that, but if you're always thinking, well, God's mad at me, or, you know, like I shared last week, one of the, one of the, the misconceptions and a false doctrine and, and such like that is that when you sin, the Holy Spirit leaves you. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, your fellowship with God is broken, but, but he's always wooing you. He doesn't leave you. You don't have to get born again and born again and born again. Every <laughs> No. Hallelujah. And so he wants you full of his fullness. And uh, Ephesians chapter 3, again, this is out of the voice. So that through faith, the anointed one will reside in their hearts. May love be the rich soil where their lives take root. May it be the bedrock where their lives are founded. So that together with all your people, they will have the power to understand that the love of the anointed is infinitely long, wide, high, and deep surpassing everything anyone previously experienced, God may your fullness flood through their entire being. See, when we understand that love, and to be honest, I think to, on this side, we, we totally can't uh, comprehend it, but we, we, can, we can come into a better and, 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 and increase in our understanding of the love that he has for us and begin to walk that out. This is Paul, part of Paul's prayer in Ephesians that we would know that love, mm -hmm. that we would experience that love. Why? So that we can walk in all the fullness of God. Why? So the world can see who we are and what God has done for us. And again, not boasting on our own uh, who we are, not boasting, not in arrogance, but this is what God's done. You know, when we talked about in the Faith and Reason series the last, uh, the last, the last week when we talked about that, you know, and, and, and Brother Tony talked about being the salt. So now we have the power to live that way, Amen. right? Yeah. We have the power to live joy-filled life. We have the power to live peace-filled life. We have the power living on the inside of us all because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Amen. Amen. So God loves us. And then number two, we are justified. Say, I'm justified. I'm justified. And, and not only that, we're declared innocent. We are justified. See, if you repented of your sin, if you have accepted Christ, if you accepted his forgiveness, guess what? You're, just, you're justified in his sight. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. We, 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 we always want to go back under that, right? You know, we'll even pray sometimes. Well, God, I did this. Or God, I gave this amount. You know, and sometimes people even, you know, well, you know, you just need to, you know, go to God and, you know, because, you, you know, it's because of all what God did, not because of what you do. Well, God, did you see how much I gave to the church last year? It's like we're trying to make a bargain with God, and it's based on works. I think God, I don't know what, I think God just probably smiles sometimes and, you know. I mean, God's nice, a lot nicer than we are. You know, a lot of, you know, we, we'd say, don't you get it yet? <laughs> I, I operate by faith. It's not by your works. Yeah. See, when you go back all the old tests, I've been reading a book by Philip Yancey, and it, it's on Amazing Grace. And, and, and the chapter I just got done reading, I was reading on the plane coming back, and I was just rereading some of it. And, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, the Levitical laws, and he puts it this way, we're, we're all oddballs. <laughs> we're all oddballs. And we all had defects. And, and you know, you study the Levitical, uh, you know, how if they had any kind of blemish in their body, they couldn't come and offer sacrifices. You know, women's and, you know, uh, women, you know, when, if they had their period, they couldn't come. And there were some other things in there about men, if you, you know, <laughs> in their manly parts. If they, if they had something wrong, they couldn't come. Had any kind of blemish. If you were a Gentile, you couldn't come. If you were this, if you want. In fact, Jewish men, this is one of the prayers they used to say, I'm glad I'm not a Gentile, and I'm glad I'm not a woman. Talk about going off on our politically correct uh, society today, <laughs> Right? You understand what I'm saying? And so any kind of defect. And so, so we're all oddballs. 
And as I was reading through this and thinking about this, that, that we are justified and declared innocent, not what we've done and not because of who we are. And, and you know, Jesus, when he came, he, he just upset the apple cart over everything. Right? He did things. The Pharisees, the Pharisees, I, I, I can imagine, man, in their religious minds, they're just going, ah. Because not only did they have the law, but then they added all this stuff to it yeah. that you had to do mm-hmm. and, and such. And, and, and so there was, there was this, and you can read it in Luke 8. And it's very interesting how, never had seen this until he was talking about this. And you look at, uh, uh, there's three things that Jesus did. And the first one, now understand this, the Gentiles were oddballs. They weren't allowed into the presence of God. Well, he goes across, sails across the, the, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee and goes over to Gentile territory, and he heals the naked madman. You all remember that? Heals the naked madman. And then he commissioned him to be the first missionary. Well, bless God, he didn't go to, he didn't go to Bible school, Jeff. How can he be a missionary? He didn't, you know, we, we had all these things. You know, Jesus commissioned him. He said, go back and tell what great things God has done for you. Comes back across, the, comes back across and, and a lady who has an issue of blood touches him. So he's already contaminated because he went where Gentiles were. And then he comes back across and, and there's a lady with an issue of blood who she's not even supposed to be out in the crowd because she's not pure. She's contaminated. She's, you know, she's an oddball. Okay, and she touches Jesus. Jesus heals her. Then, then a synagogue ruler comes to him and says, "My daughter is dying." And so he goes and he enters into a room where there's a dead person where they weren't supposed to touch dead people because it would make them impure if they touched a dead corpse. So he's contaminated three times over. Think about it for a minute. What was he doing? See, sometimes we think, well, I can't, I can't do this, or I can't go there, or I can't. You know what? He went to that Gentile person, and he healed him. Not to base on anything he had done. The woman with the issue of blood, he set her free. For 12 years, she had the issue of blood. What is he saying? He goes to the, the girl that had died. See, we look at it, oh, we're contaminated by this, we're contaminated by this. And to be honest, church, if we're not careful, we, we get into this thing, well, I can't be around sinners because I might. Well, well, Jesus had no problem because, see, Jesus, he went in. You know, a lot of times I see this and people say, well, Jesus spent time with sinners not to condone what they did, but to bring healing and wholeness into their lives. And this, he said, what does this have to do? Because he looked at people. He knew what he was going to do for people. And he's trying to give us to understand the grace and the mercy of God. Yeah. And so we're justified. Galatians 2, 16, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith. Yeah. And not by works. You know, I find it interesting. You know, isn't God kind of interesting? Takes a Jewish man, steeped in the Pharisee. I mean, he was a Pharisee, called himself a Pharisee of Pharisee, born of the tribe of Benjamin, of Israelite, of, you know, right? All these things, circumcised on the eighth day. So God takes this guy that's steeped in the Jewish law and the religious traditions of the day, and then he comes along by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We're not justified by my works. Yeah. We're not made right in God's sight by works. We're justified by faith. And we, we kind of think, yeah, but pastor, there has to be works. Yeah, there has to be works, but you're not saved by works. The works come after you're saved and you're justified. That word justified there, looked up different uh, rendings out of Thayer's, um, it's just a Greek lexicon, it says to render, that is show or regard as just or innocent. To render. So if, if a person is justified, that means they've been made innocent. If a person is justified, it means that they're not only made innocent, but that it's as if they never sinned. It means to declare innocent or guiltless, to absolve or acquit. And so because then, because we've been made justified, then we have a right to a clear conscience. 
And this is where people battle again on the inside because the enemy, the enemy of our souls, he keeps, yeah, but look what you did. You sinned here. You did this here. You blah, blah, blah. No. We've been justified. Right? Amen. Been justified by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, 14. Let me say that again. Because we have been justified, our sins have been put away and removed for us. We, have, we are entitled to a clear conscience. Hebrews 9, 14, just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself as a, to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. We have the right to a clear conscience. Why? Because we believe in Christ. Now we're justified. So I can have I, all those sinful deeds. I know, again, it's hard to comprehend. This is why I have to keep, you know, I still... I still quote, I still speak these scriptures over myself. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for me. I'm made whole by my faith in Jesus Christ, and I'm justified. And I thank you, Father God, that you don't look at the old David Kibben, you look at me in, in Christ. Hallelujah. That's good news. And it'll set you free. <laughs> it'll enable you. You know, here again, I see so many believers that are they're they're not they're not full of joy, they're not full of peace, because they're bound up in who they used to be. And the enemy of their it just bombarding their minds is that we have no joy. We have no peace. And that's not God's best. And that's what not what God desires. And then they get frustrated in their Christian walk. And so we have the right to have a clear conscience. And that word purify means to purge. All right? What do you, when, you, when you purge something, what are you doing? You're getting rid of all the impurities. You're getting rid of all, all the, the, the contaminants. I didn't get into this last week, but the Bible talks in Isaiah that he has clothed us with robes of righteousness. But he told, I can't remember which, which priest it was when in Zechariah, and, and he says, I will remove your filthy clothes. So, so he didn't just put righteousness over us. Remember the, you know, some of you came to me about the diaper illustration, <laughs> right? We can relate to that if we've had kids, you know. Now, maybe some of us dads, because we didn't want to clean up the mess. So oh, yeah, let's just put a diaper over the old dirty one. <laughs> what do you have to do? You take the old diaper off and all the mess. Do I need to get any more graphic? <laughs> right? And sometimes it's not pretty. You know, you see the things on Facebook, you know, men putting clothespins on their noses and, you know, and all these. But what do you, you clean the baby up? Right? Put some powder and other stuff, make them smell nice, and then you put a new diaper on them. And that's what God did for us through his blood. We were a mess, church. We were all a mess. We were a dirty mess. We were oddballs. And Jesus come along, and God come along. Here's my son, and his blood washes you clean of all your sins. And not only are, are you clean of all your sins, but now you have the right to a clear conscience because your sinful deeds have been done away. You've been justified. I look at you as if you never sinned. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And here's Christ's righteousness. So I'm going to clothe you with his righteousness. And you begin to see yourself that way. <coughs> see, as believers, I don't think as a believer we should ever walk with our head down. I don't think we should ever have be down in the mouth. I don't think we should ever be, well, you know. No, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I may not feel like it all the time. I may not, I may not in my mind, I may not uh, think that all the time, but I know in my heart who I am in Christ Jesus. Yes. Sometimes my feelings lie. Sometimes my mind, my soul, right? Your mind, your will, and emotions, and it kind of plays whatever with you. No, I am. I am who God says I am. And that's what you have to declare. I am who God says I am. Hallelujah. So it means to get rid of all the impurities, to, to, to be free from defilement. Hallelujah. 
You know, 1 Corinthians 13, you know, a lot of times we encourage people to read that. They're having a hard time, to, for, you know, the love chapter. And we encourage people to read that. You know, a lot of times I'll give it to new couples or, you know, if I'm counseling married couples. In fact, the, the one book I use, there's a whole chapter on that. And, and, and so we, we encourage people. And have you ever thought about this? So and this will help you too. God never requires anything out of you that he hasn't already required of himself. Amen. Proverbs 15.1 says, says this. Yeah. <laughs> if I can remember, if we can put that up there, it just went, <laughs> right? It says, oh, gentle answer turns away wrath. Now we know, you know, we think, okay, God's speaking to us. God's saying, you know, uh, we know the Bible says we are to figure out of others, right? But I hear so many people, and they'll even say this, they'll say, I know I'm forgive others, but I don't know if God forgives me. Wait a minute, are you more righteous than God? Are you more just than God? See, when we say that, really, that's a sense of pride, or that's, a, that's a, a pride when we think we can't, that God can't forgive us, but yet God requires of us to forgive others. God will never require of you. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, take no account of a suffered wrong. Now, we know God's speaking that to us, but guess what? He takes no account. You know, and, and we could say it this way, God's not a good accountant. He doesn't, you know, he hadn't written all your sins down. Well, you know, back on October 27, 2000, you did this. And I've got it in my little black book. And don't you ever forget it because I'm not, no, that's not God. That's the enemy of your soul. Right? He's the accuser of the brethren. Well, you did this. January 1958. I was only a month old, January 1958. You know what I'm saying? Seeing how, how the enemy comes in, and I'm justified. Hallelujah. Amen. Made whole. And then, so then real quick, we have peace with God. And this is so, peace uh, it has a lot of different definitions, but in Romans 5.1 it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That, that definition of peace right there means to set up one means to bring a harmonious relationship again. Oh, God. Hallelujah. So what does that mean? Now that I have peace with God, I'm in a harmonious relationship, I can come into his presence boldly. Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you glad you don't have to have someone do it for you? Yes. Right? You can do it here when we come together as a body of believers. You can do it when you go home today. You can do it in your car. You can do it at work, yeah. right? You know what I'm saying? You don't, have to, you don't have to have a special occasion. You can just say, you know, Father, I just come into your presence right now. In Jesus' name, I'm needing some grace right now, yeah. right? I'm needing some, you know, I thank you for your mercy. I'm needing some grace to get through this situation. I can just come right, just boldly walk in. You know, they talk about, you know, going back in time, <laughs> quite a few years, almost, you know, over 40 years ago. And they talk about JFK. He had a little son. Remember his little son? Mm -hmm. Right? John John. He was two or three years old. And they, they tell the story how he's sitting around with his cabinet members and they're talking about, they're talking about, it's like about 1962, they're talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, I can remember in Florida, I remember seeing all the, the you know, we lived just south of McDill Air Force Base and the jets screaming overhead and seeing the tanks moving and seeing the different things, I mean, because they're getting ready for war. They're, you know, they don't know what's going to happen. And here in comes this little two-year-old, plops himself right down on daddy's desk. The world... As we knew it at that time, it could have gone into, we could have gone to war with Russia. And here's this little two-year-old, no concern. That's his daddy's office. This is his daddy's place. Climbs right up there, still in diapers. I don't know if they were dirty or not, but he was still in diapers, okay? <laughs> Climbs right up there on the desk. That's the image you need to get of your God, yeah. of your father. What a good God we serve. Yeah. Yeah. And see, when you have peace with God, 
then you can be at peace with yourself. And when you're at peace with yourself, then you can be at peace with other people. And you can bring peace into situations. Ephesians chapter 2, last scripture, verse 14 and 15. Passion translation says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. In Isaiah chapter 40, I want to read this. This is (laughs) verse 1 and 2. It says this, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry to her. Now listen to this, that her warfare is over. And that her iniquities are pardoned. Well, you can't be speaking about natural Jerusalem because natural Jerusalem, I mean, yeah, there's a, there's a semblance of peace, but there's still war going on over there. What warfare is the prophet talking about? It's all about the war between man and God. And because of Jesus Christ, that warfare is over. Paul said it this way. You were once an enemy of God. You were once at war with God, we could say. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, I can be at peace with him. And because I'm at peace with him, I can be at peace with myself. And because I'm at peace with myself, then I can be at peace with other people and I can bring peace into situations. Hallelujah. That's good news. Amen. The warfare is over. Hallelujah. I can come into his presence. I don't have to wait for a priest. I don't have to bring in a sacrifice. I don't have to bring in, you know, and, and some people think, oh, I've got to repent of all my sins before I go into his presence. Just go into his presence. Yeah. Now, if he deals with you about something, then repent of your sins. Yeah. You know, just like John John. Not in an arrogant, you know, not in a prideful way, but because of who he is and what he's invited. Amen? Did you get anything out of this today? Hallelujah. Say this. I am am. who God says I am. Say, I am am. the righteousness of God God. in Christ Jesus. Jesus. I'm justified. justified. Just as if I never sinned. sinned. I'm innocent. I'm I'm guiltless guiltless because of the blood of Christ. Christ. I can come boldly into the very presence of God to receive help, to receive grace. Hallelujah. Say it again. I am who God says I am. I am a child of God. Hallelujah. A child of God. I'm a child of Almighty God. I'm born of Him. I have His nature in me. I have his presence on the inside of me. His spirit abides on the inside of me. Now I can live a life that is true life. Now I can live an overcoming full life. Now I can live above and not beneath. See, even, see, you know, over the years we've been encouraged to quote scriptures and, you know, we're above and not beneath, we're this and we're that, and that's great. I'm not knocking that. But if you don't get a hold of this, who you are in Christ Jesus, you'll never see yourself as above. You'll never see. I've been listening a little bit to Andrew Womack about what you see and what you imagine. And what you see and what you imagine. So begin to see yourself the way God sees you. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. Say it again. I am who God says I am. I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, I'm an overcomer. I'm, a, I, I'm above and not beneath. I am the head and not the tail. Because I'm a child of God. I'm an overcomer. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's nothing. 
There's not one thing. Young people, get a hold of this. Get a hold of this, who you are in Christ Jesus. Meditate on these things. Because the world tries to tell you this is the way you got to be, and this is who you should be. And you, gotta, you need to follow this guy, and you need to follow this girl, whatever it may be. No, you follow Jesus Christ with all your heart. And you look at what he says about you, not what the world says about you. You know, when you follow Jesus and when you, when you get a hold of who you are in Christ Jesus, you'll become smart and you'll become wise. And, and the world may look at you and say, well, you know, I know who your family, I know who your parents are. It doesn't matter. I said, God is your father now. And he created you. He recreated you in the image of Christ. And that's how he views you. And you begin to see yourself that way. And, and you'll be amazed at what God will do in you and through you. And others will be amazed as well. And, and it's not going to be in a prideful way that, you know, sometimes, well, yeah, I want others to think I'm great. No, it's because of who you are in Christ Jesus. And there'll come a humility because you realize it's not you. It's Christ in you. And what Christ has done for you. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. And you know, no matter what your age, you can change. You know, people, well, I can't teach an old dog new tricks, Pastor. That's the world's thinking. God says, all things are possible. Amen? Amen? Praise, I want you to see in touch. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We'll continue on in this identity restored say it one more time I am, I am. who God says I am, says I am. I'm, a I'm a child of God I'm the righteousness of God I'm, the righteousness I'm accepted by him I'm, accepted I'm not forsaken by him, forsaken by him. I, have I have peace with almighty God, with almighty God. because I have peace with him I can be at peace with myself and I can be at peace with others and so I thank you Father Jesus name. Jesus and when the enemy comes and he tries to remind you look what you did look what you no 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 I'm forgiven this is who I am this is what the Bible says about me this is what God says because this is God's word yes. hallelujah. hallelujah hallelujah praise Jesus father I speak a blessing over the congregation here this morning I thank you father for the revelation that understanding Lord God as we hear these things over and over again father God it'll reinforce it'll energize us Lord God to realize what you've done for us in Christ Jesus and so we we thank you for it we give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus wonderful and mighty name and and everyone said amen, amen. you know real quick here this uh, we all know uh, the world celebrates October 31st and such like that. On Wednesday night, um, I was raised in, in a reformed background. And, and so I, I want to do a teaching on Wednesday night that Halloween is more, or October 31st is more than Halloween. And I'm going to talk about what Martin Luther did for us. And it's called the Protestant Reformation. And all of us, you know, uh, we're here today because of people like Martin Luther and what he did. And I think it'll be enlightening and encourage you to come on out and, and, and you know, because sometimes we kind of get caught up. Well, October 31st is actually Reformation Day. It's Reformation Day. Hallelujah. And so if we look at it in that light, rather than get all, you know, all this, all, no. Hallelujah. So it'd be good. I encourage you to come on out on Wednesday night and uh, I, I think you'll, uh, maybe you'll learn something too, right? Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let us get to the back so we can shake your hands and have an awesome week.